A military is a heavily armed highly organized force primarily intended for warfare, also known as an armed force, typically officially authorized and maintained by a sovereign state, with its members identifiable by their distinct military uniform. It may consist of one or more military branches such as an army, navy, air force and in certain countries, marines and coast guard. The main task of the military is usually defined as defense of the state and its interests against external armed threats. Beyond warfare, the military may be employed in additional sanctioned and non-sanctioned functions within the state, including internal security threats, population control, the promotion of a political agenda, emergency services and reconstruction, protecting corporate economic interests, social ceremonies and national honor guards. For a nation's military may function as a discrete subculture within a larger civil society, through the development of separate infrastructures, which may include housing, schools, utilities, logistics, health and medical, law, food production, finance and banking. In broad usage, the terms, "...armed forces", and "...military." are often treated as synonymous, although in technical usage a distinction is sometimes made in which a country's armed forces may include both its military and other paramilitary forces. There are various forms of irregular military forces, not belonging to a recognized state, though they share many attributes with regular military forces, they are less often referred as simply, military. The profession of soldiering as part of a military is older than recorded history itself. Some of the most enduring images of classical antiquity portray the power and feats of its military leaders. The Battle of Kadesh in 1274 BC was one of the defining points of Pharaoh Ramses II's reign, and his monuments commemorate it in bas relief. A thousand years later, the first emperor of unified China, Qin Shi Huang, was so determined to impress the gods with his military might that he had himself buried with an army of terracotta soldiers. The Romans paid considerable attention to military matters, leaving to posterity many treatises and writings on the subject, as well as a large number of lavishly carved triumphal arches and victory columns. Topic: Etymology and definitions. Issue: Possibly cognate with thousand cf. Latin and Romance language root word mill. The first recorded use of the word military in English, spelled military, was in 1582. It comes from the Latin militaris, from Latin miles, meaning soldier through French, but is of uncertain etymology, one suggestion being derived from asterisk mill it going in a body or mass. The word is now identified as denoting someone that is skilled in use of weapons, or engaged in military service, or in warfare. As a noun, the military usually refers generally to a country's armed forces, or sometimes, more specifically, to the senior officers who command them. In general, it refers to the physicality of armed forces, their personnel, equipment, and the physical area which they occupy. As an adjective, military originally referred only to soldiers and soldiering, but it soon broadened to apply to land forces in general, and anything to do with their profession. The names of both the Royal Military Academy 1741 and United States Military Academy 1802 reflect this. However, at about the time of the Napoleonic Wars, military began to be used in reference to armed forces as a whole, and in the 21st century expressions like military service, military intelligence, and military history encompass naval and air force aspects. 
As such, it now connotes any activity performed by armed force personnel. History Military history is often considered to be the history of all conflicts, not just the history of the state militaries. It differs somewhat from the history of war, with military history focusing on the people and institutions of war making, while the history of war focuses on the evolution of war itself in the face of changing technology, governments, and geography. Military history has a number of facets. One main facet is to learn from past accomplishments and mistakes, so as to more effectively wage war in the future. Another is to create a sense of military tradition, which is used to create cohesive military forces. Still, another may be to learn to prevent wars more effectively. Human knowledge about the military is largely based on both recorded and oral history of military conflicts war, their participating armies and navies and, more recently, air forces. There are two types of military history, although almost all texts have elements of both, descriptive history, that serves to chronicle conflicts without offering any statements about the causes, nature of conduct, the ending, and effects of a conflict, and analytical history, that seeks to offer statements about the causes, nature, ending, and aftermath of conflicts, as a means of deriving knowledge and understanding of conflicts as a whole, and prevent repetition of mistakes in future, to suggest better concepts or methods in employing forces, or to advocate the need for new technology. Organization Personnel and units Despite the growing importance of military technology, military activity depends above all on people. For example, in 2000 the British Army declared, man is still the first weapon of war. <laughs> Rank and role The military organization is characterized by a strict hierarchy divided by military rank, with ranks normally grouped in descending order of authority as officers e.g. colonel, non-commissioned officers e.g. sergeant, and personnel at the lowest rank e.g. private soldier. While senior officers make strategic decisions, subordinated military personnel soldiers, sailors, marines, or airmen fulfill them. Although rank titles vary by military branch and country, the rank hierarchy is common to all state armed forces worldwide. In addition to their rank, personnel occupy one of many trade roles, which are often grouped according to the nature of the role's military task on combat operations, combat roles e.g. infantry, combat support roles e.g. combat engineers, and combat service support roles e.g. logistical support. Topic: <laughs> Recruitment Personnel may be recruited or conscripted, depending on the system chosen by the state. Most military personnel are males, the minority proportion of female personnel varies internationally approximately 3% in India, 10% in the UK, 13% in Sweden, 16% in the US, and 27% in South Africa. 
While two-thirds of states now recruit or conscript only adults, as of 2017 50 states still relied partly on children under the age of 18 usually aged 16 or 17 to staff their armed forces, whereas recruits who join as officers tend to be upwardly mobile. Most enlisted personnel have a childhood background of relative socioeconomic deprivation. For example, after the U.S. suspended conscription in 1973, the military disproportionately attracted African American men, men from lower status socioeconomic backgrounds, men who had been in non academic high school programs, and men whose high school grades tended to be low. Obligations The obligations of military employment are many. Full-time military employment normally requires a minimum period of service of several years, between two and six years is typical of armed forces in Australia, the UK and the US, for example, depending on role, branch, and rank. Some armed forces allow a short discharge window, normally during training, when recruits may leave the armed force as of right. Alternatively, part-time military employment, known as reserve service, allows a recruit to maintain a civilian job while training under military discipline at weekends. He or she may be called out to deploy on operations to supplement the full-time personnel complement. After leaving the armed forces, recruits may remain liable for compulsory return to full-time military employment in order to train or deploy on operations. Military law introduces offenses not recognized by civilian courts, such as absence without leave, AWOL, desertion, political acts, malingering, behaving disrespectfully, and disobedience. See, for example, offenses against military law in the United Kingdom. Penalties range from a summary reprimand to imprisonment for several years following a court martial. Certain fundamental rights are also restricted or suspended, including the freedom of association, e.g., union organizing, and freedom of speech, speaking to the media. Military personnel in some countries have a right of conscientious objection if they believe an order is immoral or unlawful, or cannot in good conscience carry it out. Personnel may be posted to bases in their home country or overseas, according to operational need, and may be deployed from those bases on exercises or operations anywhere in the world. During peacetime, when military personnel are generally stationed in garrisons or other permanent military facilities, they mostly conduct administrative tasks, training and education activities, technology maintenance, and recruitment. Training Initial training conditions recruits for the demands of military life, including preparedness to injure and kill other people, and to face mortal danger without fleeing. It is a physically and psychologically intensive process which resocializes recruits for the unique nature of military demands. For example, Individuality is suppressed e.g. by shaving the head of new recruits, issuing uniforms, denying privacy, and prohibiting the use of first names. Daily routine is tightly controlled e.g. recruits must make their beds, polish boots, and stack their clothes in a certain way, and mistakes are punished. Continuous stressor deplete psychological resistance to the demands of their instructors e.g. depriving recruits of sleep, food, or shelter, shouting insults and giving orders intended to humiliate, and Frequent punishments serve to condition group conformity and discourage poor performance. The disciplined drill instructor is presented as a role model of the ideal soldier.
Topic: Intelligence. The next requirement comes as a fairly basic need for the military to identify possible threats it may be called upon to face. For this purpose, some of the commanding forces and other military, as well as often civilian personnel participate in identification of these threats. This is at once an organization, a system and a process collectively called military intelligence me. The difficulty in using military intelligence concepts and military intelligence methods is in the nature of the secrecy of the information they seek, and the clandestine nature that intelligence operatives work in obtaining what may be plans for a conflict escalation, initiation of combat, or an invasion. An important part of the military intelligence role is the military analysis performed to assess military capability of potential future aggressors, and provide combat modeling that helps to understand factors on which comparison of forces can be made. This helps to quantify and qualify such statements as, "...China and India maintain the largest armed forces in the world," or that, the U.S. military is considered to be the world's strongest. Although some groups engaged in combat, such as militants or resistance movements, refer to themselves using military terminology, notably army or front, none have had the structure of a national military to justify the reference, and usually have had to rely on support of outside national militaries. They also use these terms to conceal from the me their true capabilities, and to impress potential ideological recruits. Having military intelligence representatives participate in the execution of the national defense policy is important, because it becomes the first respondent and commentator on the policy expected strategic goal, compared to the realities of identified threats. When the intelligence reporting is compared to the policy, it becomes possible for the national leadership to consider allocating resources over and above the officers and the subordinates' military pay, and the expense of maintaining military facilities and military support services for them. Economics. Defense economics is the financial and monetary efforts made to resource and sustain militaries, and to finance military operations, including war. The process of allocating resources is conducted by determining a military budget, which is administered by a military finance organization within the military. Military procurement is then authorized to purchase or contract provision of goods and services to the military, whether in peacetime at a permanent base, or in a combat zone from local population. <laughs> Capability development Capability development, which is often referred to as the military strength, is arguably one of the most complex activities known to humanity, because it requires determining strategic, operational, and tactical capability requirements to counter the identified threats, strategic, operational, and tactical doctrines by which the acquired capabilities will be used, identifying concepts, methods, and systems systems involved in executing the doctrines, creating design specifications for the manufacturers who would produce these in adequate quantity and quality for their use in combat, purchase the concepts, methods, and systems, create a forces structure that would use the concepts, methods, and systems most effectively and efficiently, integrate these concepts, methods, and systems into the force structure by providing military 
education, training, and practice that preferably resembles combat environment of intended use, create military logistics systems to allow continued and uninterrupted performance of military organizations under combat conditions, including provision of health services to the personnel, and maintenance for the equipment, the services to assist recovery of wounded personnel, and repair of damaged equipment, and finally, post-conflict demobilization, and disposal of war stocks surplus to peacetime requirements. Development of military doctrine is perhaps the more important of all capability development activities, because it determines how military forces were, and are used in conflicts, the concepts and methods used by the command to employ appropriately military skilled, armed and equipped personnel in achievement of the tangible goals and objectives of the war, campaign, battle, engagement, action or a duel. The line between strategy and tactics is not easily blurred, although deciding which is being discussed had sometimes been a matter of personal judgment by some commentators, and military historians. The use of forces at the level of organization between strategic and tactical is called operational mobility. There have been attempts to produce a military strength index, this is an example taken from a Credit Suisse report in September 2015. The factors under consideration for that military strength indicator and their total weights were, number of active personnel in the armed forces, 5%, tanks 10%, attack helicopters 15%, aircraft 20%, aircraft carriers 25%, and submarines 25%. It was practically impossible to make an estimation of the actual training of the armed forces. These were the results. Topic: Science. Because most of the concepts and methods used by the military, and many of its systems are not found in commercial branches, much of the material is researched, designed, developed, and offered for inclusion in arsenals by military science organizations within the overall structure of the military. Military scientists are therefore found to interact with all arms and services of the armed forces, and at all levels of the military hierarchy of command. Although concerned with research into military psychology, particularly combat stress and how it affects troop morale, often the bulk of military science activities is directed at military intelligence technology, military communications, and improving military capability through research. The design, development, and prototyping of weapons, military support equipment, and military technology in general, is also an area in which lots of effort is invested. It includes everything from global communication networks and aircraft carriers to paint and food. Topic: <laughs> Logistics. Possessing military capability is not sufficient if this capability cannot be deployed for, and employed in combat operations. To achieve this, military logistics are used for the logistics management and logistics planning of the forces military supply chain management, the consumables, and capital equipment of the troops. Although mostly concerned with the military transport, as a means of delivery using different modes of transport, from military trucks, to container ships operating from permanent military base, it also involves creating field supply dumps at the rear of the combat zone, and even forward supply points in specific units' tactical area of responsibility. 
These supply points are also used to provide military engineering services, such as the recovery of defective and derelict vehicles and weapons, maintenance of weapons in the field, the repair and field modification of weapons and equipment, and in peacetime, the life extension programs undertaken to allow continued use of equipment. One of the most important role of logistics is the supply of munitions as a primary type of consumable, their storage, and disposal. Operations While capability development is about enabling the military to perform its functions and roles in executing the defense policy, how personnel and their equipment are used in engaging the enemy, winning battles, successfully concluding campaigns, and eventually the war, is the responsibility of military operations. Military operations oversees the policy interpretation into military plans, allocation of capability to specific strategic, operational and tactical goals and objectives, change in posture of the armed forces, the interaction of combat arms, combat support arms, and combat support services during combat operations, defining of military missions and tasks during the conduct of combat, management of prisoners of war, military civil affairs, and the military occupation of enemy territory, seizure of captured equipment, and maintenance of civil order in the territory under its responsibility. Throughout the combat operations process, and during the lulls in combat, combat military intelligence provides reporting on the status of plan completion, and its correlation with desired, expected and achieved satisfaction of policy fulfillment. Performance assessment The last requirement of the military is for military performance assessment, and learning from it. These two functions are performed by military historians and military theorists who seek to identify failures and success of the armed force, and integrate corrections into the military reform, with the aim of producing an improved force capable of performing adequately, should there be a national defense policy review. In combat The primary reason for the existence of the military is to engage in combat, should it be required to do so by the national defense policy, and to win. This represents an organizational goal of any military, and the primary focus for military thought through military history. How victory is achieved, and what shape it assumes, is studied by most, if not all, military groups on three levels. <laughs> <laughs> Strategic victory Military strategy is the management of forces in wars and military campaigns by a commander-in-chief, employing large military forces, either national and allied as a whole, or the component elements of armies, navies and air forces, such as army groups, naval fleets, and large numbers of aircraft. Military strategy is a long-term projection of belligerence policy, with a broad view of outcome implications, including outside the concerns of military command. Military strategy is more concerned with the supply of war and planning, than management of field forces and combat between them. The scope of strategic military planning can span weeks, but is more often months or even years. Topic. Operational victory Operational mobility is, within warfare and military doctrine, the level of command which coordinates the minute details of tactics with the overarching goals of strategy. A common synonym is operational art. 
The operational level is at a scale bigger than one where line of sight and the time of day are important, and smaller than the strategic level, where production and politics are considerations. Formations are of the operational level if they are able to conduct operations on their own, and are of sufficient size to be directly handled or have a significant impact at the strategic level. This concept was pioneered by the German Army prior to and during the Second World War. At this level, planning and duration of activities takes from one week to a month, and are executed by field armies and Army Corps and their naval and air equivalents. Tactical victory Military tactics concerns itself with the methods for engaging and defeating the enemy in direct combat. Military tactics are usually used by units over hours or days, and are focused on the specific, close proximity tasks and objectives of squadrons, companies, battalions, regiments, brigades, and divisions, and their naval and air force equivalents. One of the oldest military publications is The Art of War, by the Chinese philosopher Sun Tzu. Written in the 6th century BCE, the 13-chapter book is intended as military instruction, and not as military theory, but has had a huge influence on Asian military doctrine, and from the late 19th century, on European and United States military planning. It has even been used to formulate business tactics, and can even be applied in social and political areas. The classical Greeks and the Romans wrote prolifically on military campaigning. Among the best-known Roman works are Julius Caesar's commentaries on the Gallic Wars, and the Roman Civil War, written about 50 BC. Two major works on tactics come from the late Roman period, Tacticae Theoria by Allianus Tacticus, and De Re Militari on military matters by Vegetius. Tactique Theoria examined Greek military tactics, and was most influential in the Byzantine world and during the Golden Age of Islam. De Re Militari formed the basis of European military tactics until the late 17th century. Perhaps its most enduring maxim is Igatur qui desiderat pacem, prepare bellum, let he who desires peace prepare for war. Due to the changing nature of combat with the introduction of artillery in the European Middle Ages, and infantry firearms in the Renaissance, attempts were made to define and identify those strategies, grand tactics, and tactics that would produce a victory more often than that achieved by the Romans in praying to the gods before the battle. Later this became known as military science, and later still, would adopt the scientific method approach to the conduct of military operations under the influence of the Industrial Revolution thinking. In his seminal book on war, the Prussian major general and leading expert on modern military strategy, Karl von Clausewitz defined military strategy as the employment of battles to gain the end of war. According to Clausewitz, Strategy forms the plan of the war, and to this end it links together the series of acts which are to lead to the final decision, that is to say, it makes the plans for the separate campaigns and regulates the combats to be fought in each. Hence, Clausewitz placed political aims above military goals, ensuring civilian control of the military. Military strategy was one of a triumvirate of arts or sciences that governed the conduct of warfare, the others being, military tactics, the execution of plans and maneuvering of forces in battle, and maintenance of an army. 
The meaning of military tactics has changed over time, from the deployment and maneuvering of entire land armies on the fields of ancient battles, and galley fleets, to modern use of small unit ambushes, encirclements, bombardment attacks, frontal assaults, air assaults, hit and run tactics used mainly by guerrilla forces, and, in some cases, suicide attacks on land and at sea. Evolution of aerial warfare introduced its own air combat tactics. Often, military deception, in the form of military camouflage or misdirection using decoys, is used to confuse the enemy as a tactic. A major development in infantry tactics came with the increased use of trench warfare in the 19th and 20th centuries. This was mainly employed in World War I in the Gallipoli Campaign, and the Western Front. Trench warfare often turned to a stalemate, only broken by a large loss of life, because, in order to attack an enemy entrenchment, soldiers had to run through an exposed no -man's land under heavy fire from their opposing entrenched enemy. Technology As with any occupation, since the ancient times, the military has been distinguished from other members of the society by the tools, the military weapons, and military equipment used in combat. When Stone Age humans first took a sliver of flint to tip the spear, it was the first example of applying technology to improve the weapon. Since then, the advances made by human societies, and that of weapons, has been irretrievably linked. Stone weapons gave way to Bronze Age weapons, and later, the Iron Age weapons. With each technological change, was realized some tangible increase in military capability, such as through greater effectiveness of a sharper edge in defeating leather armor, or improved density of materials used in manufacture of weapons. On land, the first really significant technological advance in warfare was the development of the ranged weapons, and notably, the sling. The next significant advance came with the domestication of the horses and mastering of equestrianism. Arguably, the greatest invention that affected not just the military, but all society, after adoption of fire, was the wheel, and its use in the construction of the chariot. There were no advances in military technology, until, from the mechanical arm action of a slinger, the Greeks, Egyptians, Romans, Persians, Chinese, etc., development the siege engines. The bow was manufactured in increasingly larger and more powerful versions, to increase both the weapon range, and armor penetration performance. These developed into the powerful composite and recurve bows, and crossbows of ancient China. These proved particularly useful during the rise of cavalry, as horsemen encased in ever more sophisticated armor came to dominate the battlefield. Somewhat earlier, in medieval China, gunpowder had been invented, and was increasingly used by the military in combat. The use of gunpowder in the early vase like mortars in Europe, and advanced versions of the long bow and crossbow, which all had armor-piercing arrowheads, that put an end to the dominance of the armored knight. After the long bow, which required great skill and strength to use, the next most significant technological advance was the musket, which could be used effectively, with little training. In time, the successes to muskets and cannon, in the form of rifles and artillery, would become core battlefield technology. As the speed of technological advances accelerated in civilian applications, so too warfare became more industrialized. The newly invented machine gun and repeating rifle redefined firepower on the battlefield, and, in part, explains the high casualty rates of the American Civil War. 
The next breakthrough was the conversion of artillery parks from the muzzle loading guns to the quicker loading breech loading guns with recoiling barrel that allowed quicker aimed fire and use of a shield. The widespread introduction of low smoke smokeless propellant powders since the 1880s also allowed for a great improvement of artillery ranges. The development of breech loading had the greatest effect on naval warfare, for the first time since the Middle Ages, altering the way weapons are mounted on warships, and therefore naval tactics, now divorced from the reliance on sails with the invention of the internal combustion. A further advance in military naval technology was the design of the submarine, and its weapon, the torpedo. Main battle tanks, and other heavy equipment such as armored fighting vehicles, military aircraft, and ships, are characteristic to organized military forces. During World War I, the need to break the deadlock of trench warfare saw the rapid development of many new technologies, particularly tanks. Military aviation was extensively used, and bombers became decisive in many battles of World War II, which marked the most frantic period of weapons development in history. Many new designs, and concepts were used in combat, and all existing technologies of warfare were improved between 1939 and 1945. During the war, significant advances were made in military communications through increased use of radio, military intelligence through use of the radar, and in military medicine through use of penicillin. While in the air, the guided missile, jet aircraft, and helicopters were seen for the first time. Perhaps the most infamous of all military technologies was the creation of the atomic bomb, although the exact effects of its radiation were unknown until the early 1950s. Far greater use of military vehicles had finally eliminated the cavalry from the military force structure. After World War II, with the onset of the Cold War, the constant technological development of new weapons was institutionalized, as participants engaged in a constant arms race in capability development. This constant state of weapons development continues into the present, and remains a constant drain on national resources, which some blame on the military-industrial complex. The most significant technological developments that influenced combat have been the guided missiles, which can be used by all branches of the armed services. More recently, information technology, and its use in surveillance, including space-based reconnaissance systems, have played an increasing role in military operations. The impact of information warfare that focuses on attacking command communication systems, and military databases, has been coupled with the new development in military technology, has been the use of robotic systems in intelligence combat, both in hardware and software applications. Recently, there has also been a particular focus towards the use of renewable fuels for running military vehicles on. Unlike fossil fuels, renewable fuels can be produced in any country, creating a strategic advantage. The U.S. military has already committed itself to have 50% of its energy consumption come from alternative sources. As part of society For much of military history, the armed forces were considered to be for use by the heads of their societies, until recently, the crowned heads of states. In a democracy or other political system run in the public interest, it is a public force. The relationship between the military and the society it serves is a complicated and ever-evolving one. 
Much depends on the nature of the society itself, and whether it sees the military as important, as for example in time of threat or war, or a burdensome expense typified by defense cuts in time of peace. One difficult matter in the relation between military and society is control and transparency. In some countries, limited information on military operations and budgeting is accessible for the public. However transparency in the military sector is crucial to fight corruption. This showed the Government Defence Anti-Corruption Index Transparency International UK published in 2013. Militaries often function as societies within societies, by having their own military communities, economies, education, medicine, and other aspects of a functioning civilian society. Although a military is not limited to nations in of itself as many private military companies or PMCs can be used or hired by organizations and figures as security, escort, or other means of protection, where police, agencies, or militaries are absent or not trusted. <laughs> Ideology and ethics Militarist ideology is the society's social attitude of being best served, or being a beneficiary of a government, or guided by concepts embodied in the military culture, doctrine, system, or leaders. Either because of the cultural memory, national history, or the potentiality of a military threat, the militarist argument asserts that a civilian population is dependent upon, and thereby subservient to the needs and goals of its military for continued independence. Militarism is sometimes contrasted with the concepts of comprehensive national power, soft power and hard power. Most nations have separate military laws which regulate conduct in war and during peacetime. An early exponent was Hugo Grotius, whose On the Law of War and Peace 1625, had a major impact of the humanitarian approach to warfare development. His theme was echoed by Gustavus Adolphus. Ethics of warfare have developed since 1945, to create constraints on the military treatment of prisoners and civilians, primarily by the Geneva Conventions, but rarely apply to use of the military forces as internal security troops during times of political conflict that results in popular protests and incitement to popular uprising. International protocols restrict the use, or have even created international bans on some types of weapons, notably weapons of mass destruction WMD. International conventions define what constitutes a war crime, and provides for war crimes prosecution. Individual countries also have elaborate codes of military justice, an example being the United States Uniform Code of Military Justice that can lead to court-martial for military personnel found guilty of war crimes. Military actions are sometimes argued to be justified by furthering a humanitarian cause, such as disaster relief operations, or in defense of refugees. The term military humanism is used to refer to such actions. Topic: <inaudible> Stereotypes. A military brat is a colloquial term for a child with at least one parent who served as an active duty member, vice reserve in the armed forces. Children of armed forces members may move around to different military bases or international postings, which gives them a childhood differing from the norm. Unlike common usage of the term brat, when it is used in this context, it is not necessarily a derogatory term. In the media 
Soldiers and armies have been prominent in popular culture since the beginnings of recorded history. In addition to the countless images of military leaders in heroic poses from antiquity, they have been an enduring source of inspiration in war literature. Not all of this has been entirely complementary, and the military have been lampooned or ridiculed as often as they have been idolized. The classical Greek writer Aristophanes, devoted an entire comedy, Lysistrata, to a strike organized by military wives, where they withhold sex from their husbands to prevent them from going to war. In medieval Europe, tales of knighthood and chivalry, the officer class of the period captured the popular imagination. Writers and poets like Taliesin, Cretan de Troyes and Thomas Mallory wrote tales of daring do, featuring Arthur, Guinevere, Lancelot and Galahad. Even in the 21st century, books and films about the Arthurian legend and the Holy Grail continue to appear. A century or so later, in the hands of writers such as Jean Froissart, Miguel Cervantes and William Shakespeare, the fictional knight Tarant Lo Blanche, and the real-life condottieri John Hawkwood would be juxtaposed against the fantastical Don Quixote, and the carousing Sir John Falstaff. In just one play, Henry V, Shakespeare provides a whole range of military characters, from cool-headed and clear-sighted generals, to captains, and common soldiery. The rapid growth of movable type in the late 16th century and early 17th century saw an upsurge in private publication. Political pamphlets became popular, often lampooning military leaders for political purposes. A pamphlet directed against Prince Rupert of the Rhine is a typical example. During the 19th century, irreverence towards authority was at its height, and for every elegant military gentleman painted by the master portraitists of the European courts, for example, Gainsborough, Goya, and Reynolds, there are the sometimes affectionate and sometimes savage caricatures of Roland and Hogarth. This continued in the 19th century, with publications like Punch in the British Empire and Le Perry du Chêne in France, poking fun at the military establishment. This extended to media other print also. An enduring example is the Major General's song from the Gilbert and Sullivan Light Opera, The Pirates of Penzance, where a senior army officer is satirized for his enormous fund of irrelevant knowledge. The increasing importance of cinema in the early 20th century provided a new platform for depictions of military subjects. During the First World War, although heavily censored, newsreels enabled those at home to see for themselves a heavily sanitized version of life at the front line. About the same time, both pro-war and anti-war films came to the silver screen. One of the first films on military aviation, Hell's Angels, broke all box office records on its release in 1929. Soon, war films of all types were showing throughout the world, notably those of Charlie Chaplin who actively promoted war bonds and voluntary enlistment. The First World War was also responsible for a new kind of military depiction, through poetry. Hitherto, poetry had been used mostly to glorify or sanctify war. The Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred, Lord Tennyson, with its galloping hoofbeat rhythm, is a prime late Victorian example of this, though Rudyard Kipling had written a scathing reply, The Last of the Light Brigade, criticizing the poverty in which many Light Brigade veterans found themselves in old age. Instead, the new wave of poetry, from the war poets, was written from the point of view of the disenchanted trench soldier. Leading war poets included Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen, John McCrae, Rupert Brooke, Isaac Rosenberg, and David Jones. 
A similar movement occurred in literature, producing a slew of novels on both sides of the Atlantic, including notably, All Quiet on the Western Front, and Johnny Got His Gun. The 1963 English stage musical Oh, What a Lovely War, provided a satirical take on World War I, which was released in a cinematic version directed by Richard Attenborough in 1969. The propaganda war that accompanied World War II invariably depicted the enemy in unflattering terms. Examples of this exist not only in posters, but also in the films of Leni Riefenstahl and Sergei Eisenstein. Alongside this, World War II also inspired films as varied as The Dam Busters, 633 Squadron, Bridge on the River Kwai, The Longest Day, Catch-22, Saving Private Ryan, and The Sea Shall Not Have Them. The next major event, the Korean War inspired a long-running television series M** KSH. With the Vietnam War, the tide of balance turned, and its films, notably Apocalypse Now, Good Morning, Vietnam, Go Tell the Spartans, Born on the Fourth of July, and We Were Soldiers, have tended to contain critical messages. There is even a nursery rhyme about war, the grand old Duke of York, ridiculing a general for his inability to command any further than marching his men up and down a hill. The huge number of songs focusing on war include and the band played waltzing Matilda and Universal Soldier. See also Armed Forces of the World List of Countries by Number of Military and Paramilitary Personnel List of Countries by Military Strength Index List of Countries by Level of Military Equipment List of Countries by Global Militarization Index List of Countries without Armed Forces List of Countries by Military Expenditures List of countries by past military expenditure List of countries by military expenditure per capita List of air forces List of armies List of navies <laughs>